Being an electric vehicle, the Tesla Model 3 performance doesn't have a lot of venues to compete at on a racetrack. However, recently, the Mountain Pass Performance Tesla ended up on the podium at Global Time Attack, and it was disqualified due to the fact that it doesn't run on an approved fuel source. So I thought I'd catch up with Mountain Pass Performance near Toronto at their shop and talk with them about their take on EVs and what they are doing to improve the performance of electric vehicles for enthusiasts like us, and here's my interview with them. I've traveled over 2,000 miles to meet Mountain Pass Performance here in Southern Ontario in Canada, but it's not very mountainous. Sasha runs Mountain Pass Performance, and if you saw a video previously on the Global Time Attack with the Tesla Model 3 Performance, it almost won the series, but it didn't because there's a little hint, there's a little uh, problem with the rules. So tell me about this. It was my last video. Tell me what sort of happened with this whole series and, and you guys entering it, but not really winning. Oh yeah, it's kind of a long story. So we kind of just went there just to see how fast we could go. When we got there, I realized that since I'm not the owner of the car, I'm not technically allowed to compete. Uh, Cameron placed the second fastest time and I had placed the fastest time in our class, um, but my time didn't count. And then after Cameron even set his second fastest time, he was protested at some point um, during that second day. So we were like, in the end, we were disqualified um, because our car was powered not by an approved fuel. In terms of you know modifying these cars, we're obviously a little bit limited. What does Mountain Pass Performance have in terms of modifying these cars? Yeah, so if you look at the Model 3, it's designed for a huge demographic. Um, you know, people that just want a comfortable car, drive around town, driving really broken roads. So we're taking the Model 3's like incredible chassis and potential and we're letting it turn into what you know we effectively keep comparing to this BMW M3 but that's really what it is I mean put some sport suspension on this car and upgrade the brakes and all of a sudden it is the best handling I would say I would argue the best handling sedan period really so so why is that because you know, I think of a BMW M3 as, as sort of a high point in sedans in terms of handling. Right, well you've just got this super stiff structure um, that protects the battery cells, but that also makes the chassis incredibly rigid and all of that mass is down low, so you've got a really low center of gravity. And then Tesla's obviously done an incredible job, maybe from their Lotus heritage, I don't know, but the front suspension geometry on this car is incredible. The rear suspension geometry is, you know, typical what you'd expect in a modern sedan, really good. and. So literally you change the suspension, uh, the coilovers and some suspension arms, get rid of some more bushings and upgrade the brakes. Like it, the car is turning before you even think that you want to turn. It basically feels like it's a thousand pounds lighter than it is because the center of gravity is so low. So what else have you got going on for this car? So you've got some suspension bits available. What about power mods? Is it possible to modify the power in these cars? That's obviously what all enthusiasts, you know, really think about. Right, so to answer your question, is it possible? Of course it's possible. Uh, is there a business model to doing that? Right now we're still exploring that space. The main problem is that Tesla can do over-the-air updates at any time. So if we're to go change a module or update something or you know anything you can imagine and make it work with Tesla with this vehicle today, there's nothing to say that there's not an over-the-air update that means we have to do tens or hundreds or thousands of hours of more development to continue to you know support that product in the future. So we're nervous about that. We don't want to produce a product or like, obviously this is a lot of work we're talking about. It's not just like, you know, putting on a bigger turbo or something. There's a lot of work to being able to, you know, make a custom inverter or changing the motor. We don't want to go down that road just to realize that, you know, we can't sell this product because, you know, every six months or every three months, we have to totally rewrite the, the communications code and make it all happy with the car. So yeah, it's totally possible. I don't know that it's feasible or it makes sense to do that with, for a road car. So when you're dealing with the Tesla, you've got stability control, you've got traction control, and you've got these things in a regular powered vehicle too that's powered by a dinosaur juice. But you know, here it's more integral to the whole environment basically because you can just turn off traction control or stability in a normal car. But you know, what do you do over here when the whole, you know, drivetrain is, is uh, is completely different than it is in an ICE vehicle. Yeah, so I mean, it's not really that different, actually. The reality is if Tesla gave us an option, just a button to turn it all off, we could just not need to make this product, but for one reason or another, Tesla's made the decision to not allow the user to turn off traction control and to turn off stability control. So we're working on a module that 
basically does that and hopefully has even more features to kind of emulate track mode for non-performance Model 3 cars. So in terms of braking and suspension, people that want to go fast in a, you know, on a track environment or just on the street, what do you offer? Right, so we've got a brake upgrade for right now the, rear, the standard Model 3 and we're also working on an upgrade for the performance Model 3. The factory brakes on the Model 3 are really small. Um, they overheat, you know, less than one lap on the track. We've got a big brake kit for the front. We sell uh, upgraded pads. We can also help source uh, race pads. I noticed we're standing in front of a what appears to be a Lotus Evora, but this is not any Lotus Evora. Tell me about this. This is the first car that you use as a development uh, mule, right? It first started as what car do we want to convert to be electric as a performance sports car? So we knew we wanted something that was mid-engine. We knew we wanted something that was fairly exotic and not too, too common and something that would be reasonably straightforward for us to reverse engineer. So the Evora ticks all those boxes perfectly. You know, it's got a clamshell fiberglass body that just comes off. So that's great for us to get in there and, and work with the frame. I don't know how many Evoras you see on the road. I don't see any ever. Most people think that this is a Tesla Roadster when we tell them it's electric. They just assume it's the original Tesla Roadster. And we feel we've built the car to a really high kind of level. We wanted to make everything like OEM feel. So if you take a look in the interior, you'll see that you know, it's all integrated, there's no buttons and switches you have to flip. You just put the key in, turn it on, and you can drive the car. So you've pulled the Toyota motor out of this. What have you actually done to this thing? Yeah, so we took the Toyota Camry V6 out of it, uh, and we put in a Tesla Model S drive unit. So it now has 470 horsepower at the wheels. Um, it's like a low 11 second quarter mile time, low 3 seconds, 0 to 60 time. So it's, it's really quick. Um, it's powered by two Chevrolet Volt battery packs. Um, so. Those batteries are really great because they have a ton of power uh, capability. So the battery pack's not massive, um, but this isn't a road tripping car, right? So the battery pack suits the, the goal of the vehicle. We've had it up to time attack events. We've won, and I think we've set uh, records at Toronto Motorsports Park with it. So it's been really capable. And, and again, this is the kind of thing where we weren't building a race car, but we wanted to prove the benchmark for this car was a GD3 RS. We said, okay, we want to be able to be the same weight as a GD3 RS, which we are, 3,200 pounds. We want to have the same 0 to 60 time as a GD3 RS, but we're faster. And we want to have the same lap time as a GD3 RS at our local track. Now, the caveat to all that is if we want to do a high speed track like most sport, this car is not going to match it. I mean, an electric car is really great up to about 150 kilometers an hour or, you know, 110 miles per hour, say. Beyond that, you know, the Porsche is going to stretch his legs and, and definitely it's going to outpace this thing. But otherwise, the car is super capable and it's awesome on the street because the response is instant. So I asked you what you wanted to hear about EVs and some of the questions you had. One of the most important ones, or one of the, I think the biggest ones is like, what's going on with the carbon footprint of an EV versus a traditional ICE car? There's been a lot of debate on it. There's been some studies. You know, what's your take? Does it really, you know, driving an EV, is there really less of a carbon footprint? I love this question because I think it's so ridiculous. The, the, the answer to that question is very simple. Can you produce gasoline in your house? Not currently. <laughs> okay, but I can put solar panels on my roof and I can put that power into the car. Even if you're living somewhere where your grid is not clean, that is an invalid excuse because you have the power and the tools and it's actually probably cheaper depending on where you live to produce your own electricity than it is to buy it. So even if you live in like the one state or like, I don't even think that's even dirtier than a gas powered car. But even if it was, if you produce your own electricity, which is an investment and will actually be cheaper than buying it, the car is way cleaner than a gas-powered vehicle. So to me, anyone that makes that excuse or that, that argument, like it's already been proven to be invalid in pretty much every state, it's just like you can't make your own fuel, but you can make your own electricity. Right, but what if you live in a large city like you know New York or San Francisco or Los Angeles, something like that where you can't really make your own power, it's just not practical, you live in a condo or an apartment? Almost every single state, it's still cleaner, depending on how you, you add it up, but by the time you get the oil out, refine it, transport it, put it in the car, burn it, I still think that is worse in total CO2 emissions because stationary power plants are more efficient than burning it in a vehicle and like sitting there idling not you know that's zero percent efficiency when you're sitting there idling that's zero percent efficiency you're literally just turning fuel into heat at least a power plant is always running at the most efficiency it can and an electric car is much more efficient at transferring electricity to motion 
than gasliness. We've been talking about these EVs for the last couple of minutes here. It's a little bit cold outside, but uh, you know maybe I can come back in the summer and uh, take a ride in, in some of your uh, your electric hot rods. Yeah, sure. I've got this uh, Evora around here, so we'd love to take you for a ride in it. If you've got any more questions about EVs, leave them down in the comments below. If you have questions for him, Sasha, leave them in the comments below. I'm Eric. If you want to see more videos on EVs and performance cars in general, just click on the card at the end of the video. I'll see you in the next one.